Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to another Final Fantasy XIV Let's Play video. Now, after Pharaoh Ser now, I'm sorry, after St. Mosean's Arboretum, we have Pharaoh Serious Hard Mode, the other patch 3.1 dungeon for Heavensward. It's got the same item level rewards, it's got the same entry requirements, the only difference is there's a different quest involved. Now, because it's a hard mode of the original dungeon, you'll need to have completed the original Pharaoh Sirius. Now, there's a couple of quests that you need to do for this, a total of three with Pharaoh Sirius hard mode being the third quest. The first one is Serious Business. I believe I did this, this dungeon in one of the earlier parts, so if you just go through the series and look for the original Pharaoh Sirius, it probably explains it there. But after you clear the 2.0 story, you can get the quest for Pharaoh Sirius from the quest uh, from Dia, excuse me, Diamanda in Western Lenosha. So if you teleport to, I think the Aleport teleport takes you there, you'll find the quest Sirius Business. That will allow you to unlock the original Pharaoh Sirius. After that, there will be a follow-up quest called Why So Serious, which is also from Diamanda after you've completed the first quest. That one's just a quick talk to a few NPCs. After that, things are getting serious. We picked this up in one of the earlier parts for the Final Fantasy XIV Let's Play series, sometime, I think, when we were unlocking everything at 60. Uh, and that's actually in the Limps of Lomenta Upper Decks. Once you've accepted that, you actually have to go to... Well, I mean, you just follow the quest. I, mean, I don't need to tell you where you go next. After, once I tell you where to get a quest, you should know to follow the quest, you know. But uh, it just so happens that I uh, I gotta go to the lift attendant. Yes, I gotta go to the lift attendant. I gotta go to the airship landing, and that will actually spawn the entrance to Pharaoh's serious hard mode. I like this dungeon a little bit. There's some things I like and some things I don't like about this dungeon. It does some things a little bit differently, and it's quite some fun. And it does some things just nothing exciting at all. The last boss for me is not very exciting, although it definitely could have been. Some of the trash pulls are more exciting for me, that's for certain. Uh, but anyway, now that we have that open, I'm going to go to it in the duty finder. As you can see, it was that for uh, Pharaoh Sirius. It's, I keep saying that. It was that for St. Mosion's Arboretum, and it's the same rewards for Pharaoh Sirius hard mode. Same item, item level 170 to enter, and the item level sync is uh, 240. We are nowhere near that, but uh, you know what? Uh, the notion is still appreciated. So St. Mosion's Arboretum was actually instant for me. I am going to hope that this is not a long queue either. So I'll be back, hopefully this time, without forgetting to press the start record button. And uh, yeah, I'll see you when the queue actually pops. All right, it says that I'm recording. <laughs> I'm not making that mistake two videos in a row. And this only took uh, about three or four minutes to actually uh, pop. Oh, somebody just said hello to me, right? As I feel bad. Somebody said hello to me right as I was queuing in. So, sorry. At least you'll know, if you watch the video, that is, you'll know. So, welcome to Pharaoh Serious Hard Mode. Sorry, I just dropped my headset. Pharaoh Serious Hard Mode, fun dungeon. I personally think the original Pharaoh Serious is the more fun dungeon, but all the same, looking forward to getting through this one with you guys. So, looks like I'm not the only first-timer here, uh, but we do have a pretty good AoE comp for this. Uh, Black Mage Summoner. Solid. I mean, Bard, Black Major Bard Summoner, of course, for the vulnerability. Always welcome. Oh, actually, I wonder if he was actually watching the cutscene or if he was just lagging. Because uh, my Protect hit him even though he wasn't loaded in all the way yet. That's usually a sign that you're just going full toaster status. I think they were auto-running, trying to type something. Because <laughs> they looked like they were going off to the side. So the first few pulls in here, really simple. Uh, there are a couple ways to do them. There's four corruptions and a corrupted flan. I would recommend paying the most attention. If you're going to mark anything or focus, it's going to be the corrupted flan. It does a considerable amount of damage. I mean, all of this stuff does a considerable amount of damage. But honestly, I'd say that for this first part of the dungeon, you're probably going to have next to zero issues. Mostly because the corruptions, the individual, the, the four corruptions, actually, as you can see, just straight up melt. Especially when you have this kind of AoE damage. You know what I just realized? This Corrupted Flan actually doesn't do anything special. I thought this Corrupted Flan... Oh, maybe it does cast Banish 3. I thought it casted Banish 3 because I, I saw it spamming Banish. I actually don't think I've ever seen it live long enough to cast Banish. But that was the theory. That's why I say it's the only one that maybe presents a threat, because Banish 3 in the original Pharaoh series is actually a huge threat. I don't think it actually ever gets the opportunity. I mean, it's the slime spawn, but that's not a threat. This one also auto-attacks more than it casts Banish, in all honesty. 
So pretty simple first few pulls. We're actually not far from the first boss, believe it or not. There's, I think, four mobs at the bottom of this little uh, crystal staircase right here. And I think, and then it's literally the boss. Now, those of you who play Final Fantasy XI, or have played it, I'm warning you now. The first boss is literally a boss from C. I guess I don't know why that's a warning. It's not like he does the exact same thing. He doesn't do anything remotely close to the exact same thing. But it's more like just to prepare yourself because the comment section will say, LOL, uh, Jailer of... Which Jailer was this? Was it Fortitude? I think it was Jailer of Fortitude. It's a, gr it's a Graal Luminary, more specifically. But it's, it's friggin... It's Jailer. It's Jailer of Fortitude. I'm pretty sure Jailer of Fortitude is the one I'm thinking of. Alright, so we'll just AoE these down. Now, some AoEs drop while you're killing these guys, and they leave behind those uh, poison clouds. If you touch the poison cloud, they explode. If you don't touch them, nothing happens. So, most of the time, nothing's going to happen, because they're super easy to dodge. And then you fall down here at the last one. Now, if you actually want this additional treasure coffer, you have to actually fall and land on it, but it's not really that relevant. See, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it was Fortitude, because Temperance is the one that has the resistances, so it couldn't be him. Now, I will say this is Vorpal Blade attack actually hits pretty friggin' hard, but you notice that as soon as we pulled the boss, a bunch of birds and spiders actually spawned along the outside of the arena. This is important for the pretty much primary mechanic of the entirety of the fight. Which we'll see any second now. <laughs> there it is. So see that tether? Whoever's tethered to one of the gra ads needs to pass that tether off to one of the monsters around the arena if it's on you then it spawns a much stronger enemy that gives the boss a stacking damage buff you don't want that so you just need to walk in range of one of the other ads now i would prefer if you don't go for the spiders personally the spiders when they have the tether they actually spawn poison puddles, same with when the spiders die, so they're the less preferred one to get. I mean, it's better that you get them than you, but the birds are far easier to deal with. Oh, wow. One a size was enough to kill them. I actually didn't know that. I didn't think it did enough damage for that. There we go. I'll pass this off to you. I mean, you can pass it off, but you can see they're kind of actively going for things that aren't the spiders. I think we have one spider over there. Yeah, that's not that bad. So as a healer, what I like to do is I like to do this. Whoop! Get the holy off, and as you can see, they're almost all dead. I actually thought that would kill them all. The swift cast holy, but I guess the assize is a little bit stronger. Oh yeah, tied right next to me. Woo! And that's it. That's the whole boss fight. Pretty simple. The adds are really simple to deal with. I especially like DPSing them as the healer, but they are weak, so you really don't need to make the healer do it. It's fine as is to just, uh, you know, have the DPS throw one or two spells over to them. That'll be enough to kill them off, to be honest. We're still hoping for a neck piece. Uh, not a neck piece, an earring. That would be the only piece we could really use. Now, this part's a little bit more fun. Uh, so from this point on, there's going to be gauntlets of exploding bombs. Uh, you can see them. There's the time bomb. So as you walk up close to the time bomb, the time bomb will actually attempt to explode. These ads also hit considerably hard. But it just means that this time bomb flow is infinite until you get to the end and destroy the bomb generator. So the most common strategy is to try and pull as many mobs as you can all at once while just kind of straight up ignoring the time bombs. So it looks like he trusts me enough for us to do the entire pull. This is a little bit scary. Uh, if I was with a healer who is not that close to the item level sink, I would probably be a little bit more cautious. I'm pretty close to 200 though. 210 was the maximum item level when this dungeon came out, and it was so for a while, and this pull was possible then. So I'm actually in a at a safe level range in terms of that. I'm going to give him this and i am going to go for some dps here so you can see that's the uh that's the bomb generator right there and we just need one more ability i think yep it's dead so no more bombs are going to be spawning now it's just these ads that we got to deal with 
But as you can see, like, once his cooldowns were off, like, these hits are pretty substantial on him. Like, if I got Cleric locked here, it would be really bad. It's not, a, it's not an amount of damage that can be completely ignored. So the higher your item level is here, the better it's going to be. The fact that we have a, a major AoE comp definitely helps as well. Because we are able to push down some of the enemies and reduce the outgoing damage here. So the tank is safer to do his things. Honestly, I could have done the whole Benny thing that I've kind of spoken about a lot, but not really done a whole lot in this series. But uh, you know what? Play it safe. Not too bad, not too bad. We could have even just gone and pulled them all the way to the bottom, in all honesty. And then you just have to kill three more enemies, and you're on to the second boss. Second boss, fight changes a lot depending on how much DPS you have. Uh, I think, based on the way the first fight went, we'll probably have to do two jump phases, as opposed to just one. Not there's, The jump phases aren't hard at all, but I'm just uh, taking note of it myself. I'm going to throw him those. Oh, nice. The Tetra Crit. Add some holies out. All this magic damage. Oh, I didn't mean to do that last holy. That only hit the one target. I didn't mean to do that. There's a key you got to pick up. He picked it up. I'm going to go unlock the door. And we are at the second boss. So the second boss here is the 8th Order Patriarch Begu. Not that hard of a boss. So he has one major mechanic that you can either have your healer or your DPS do. Again, I am going to be assuming responsibility of this mechanic. So he's going to do this jump right here. And when he does this jump, he's going to leave a gas. Like a, he's, going to, he's going to rupture an ether valve, which is right here. You need to patch that ether valve. So whoever... DPS's the corrupted gel will actually pull aggro on it and they will be inseparable to that thing unless they die you need to kill the gels on top of where the ether valves are destroyed so you saw me do that there I'm going to give him a regen I'm going to run over to the other one and I'm going to do it again it looked like the black mage pretty much waited until I was on top of it and then he threw a spell on it and there you go. See, it covers up the uh, valve. If you don't cover up the valve, it's going to hurt a lot. Now, this is the other major mechanic that he does. He go he summons himself a, a lightning armor. And if you attack him while he's in this physical or magical, he'll stun you. And then he just dashes across the room. Your goal is to kill off the furnace men and to uh, kill off the engines themselves so you can actually go back to DPSing him while dodging these AoEs. He's going to do one more dash across. We actually should have killed the Furnace Men first so we don't have to deal with them while he's in that last charge animation. And he's going to do it again. Now, if you do enough DPS here, you can just outright skip this second one. And uh, you could just LB him, and you, don't, you literally don't have to do any more mechanics. We're not going to do that, so... It's not a big deal. It just means we have to kill one more set of engines and one more set of uh, one more set of ads, and then he'll die. Some groups just try to honestly push through the stun and kill him. We're not doing that. I, you know, it's kind of annoying to try and do because the stun makes it easier to get hit by the AOEs. So uh, we just do it the old-fashioned way. Probably should have used that aside when all the ads were up, but uh, you know. It's the thought that counts. How of the Red Thief. I'm pretty sure it's the second time in a row I've seen that. And then we're on to the trash between the second and third boss. This one can also be kind of fun. Depends on the way he goes to do it. I think he'll do the biggest possible pull based on the way... Wait a minute. Where's your protect? Did you... Did you click it off? Did you have... Maybe he had one when he came in. And it isn't that he... He had hit him. Oh, okay. Maybe he had one coming into the dungeon. That's what actually happened. All right. That makes sense. All right. So first trash pull, real easy. Uh, you can't do a pull any bigger than this. You kill the bomb incubator. You kill the Pikmin. And then you move on. Not Pikmin, but you have a Bedsman. You, you kill the... You kill the Cobalts. That's what you do. You kill the Cobalts. 
Alright, I kind of had to DPS a little bit more there than I initially anticipated. And now, it's this is where the, the men are separated from the boys. He either does the entire rest of the dungeon, except for the boss, or he does this room and then the rest of the dungeon. Uh, either way, should be fun. So there's those two ads. You have the living rock, the living Dwayne. It looks like he's going to go all the way. So this is a very interesting pull because this one's far from traditional in terms of big pulls. You have the simple bomb incubators. There's three of them, and they're summoning bombs. There's also a construct that's attacking a wall. If those walls are destroyed, then more ads spawn. It's not the end of the world if that happens, but, I mean, if you can avoid it, you would, right? So the goal is usually to kill the incubators first so that they stop summoning bombs. That removes, and then have the tank pull all the ads. It removes all of the threat from all of the walls. There's no way those walls can get hit unless you're tanking the mobs on top of the walls at this point. So we've got one, almost two of the bomb incubators dead. And then it's just a matter of picking off the remaining ads. You know what, I'm just gonna do that. Ugh. I'm not doing... Ugh, come on, I keep getting cleric locked. Got cleric locked like two or three times already. Alright, he's got the convalescence up. I went full focus mode. It was kind of a disjointed effort. Normally the bomb incubators aren't available for so long and you have more DPS on top of the actual monsters. But that didn't happen for us, so they were alive way longer than we kind of wanted them to be. It worked out, but I definitely wasn't able to output as much as I would have liked. And then you're on to the final boss. Final boss is, I just call her the Bomb Queen. It is who it is. They call it the the Progenitrix, plus there's another name for it coming up. I don't. I might have stone skin by the time that person runs over here. If not, I'm just going to try to time it. No, I'll have it just in time. I wasn't sure when I used it for that holy over there. All right, so the Progenitrix is a two-phase encounter. It's a three-phase encounter, technically. The first phase is really, really simple. She doesn't have a lot of health, and she doesn't deal a lot of damage. She has an AoE to dodge called Sap. Barely even need to pay any mind to that. Bombshell Drop, I think is... Uh, yeah, this is where she summons some adds. So here she summons a handful of adds around. The one... So these two Lava Bombs will go and actually start attacking a target. The Gray Bomb, on the other hand... We'll just straight up shoot AoE. Uh, we'll just shoot... I'm not AoEs. It'll shoot fires at people. When she gets low on health, she's going to go to the center of the room. And I say low, I mean 10%. And start casting Big Burst. If you don't kill her before Big Burst goes off, well, I think you can figure out what happens. It does, As you can see, it does negligible damage otherwise. Now she summons six bombs. She summons three of the gray bombs and three of the lava bombs. Tank picks up the lava bombs. And everyone else just kills the gray bombs. Technically, the Grey Bombs have an aggro table, and because I'm they're spread out all over the room, though, it's hard to really expect people to deal with them. Now, if you don't kill Grey Bombs fast enough, they actually grow, and eventually, they start dealing massive amounts of damage. That's not going to be the case here. They're not going to get to deal massive amounts of damage here. They're just going to get to deal some damage here. Now, the boss comes back as the, progen the progenitor, and has the blue flame attack, which as you can see is an AoE. I put up the Medica 2 early so I could just let it tick up through that as opposed to me having to do it afterwards because it doesn't do enough damage to really warrant me to spend a cast on it. But at the same time, I don't want to leave people not topped off. Now, this phase does have a mechanic that is very capable of wiping unprepared groups. Don't know why I did that right there. Just pretend that didn't happen. As you can see, her damage is, like, insignificant. It's just this part kind of sucks. So she does Big Burst, 
which you did in the first phase, doesn't do a whole lot. But then she summons an ad. She summons two ads. She summons this big bomb. She summons this gray bomb right here and a remedy bomb. So the remedy bomb is the threat. Basically what the remedy bomb does is it beelines for the nearest gray bomb. And if it stays tethered to the gray bomb long enough, it actually, uh, it actually explodes and does a massive amount of damage. As you can see, all I did was literally stand next to the gray bomb and just spam arrow one on the target. I had no interest in actually having to deal with that mechanic in any way. Now, when she does big burst the second time, it's a little bit different because now there are two gray bombs and two remedy bombs. So now it's a it's you know, I can't as easily ward them away because I can't just solo ward them away like I was before. I can still handle one of them, but I can't do it solo because there's still two remedy bombs even if you kill one of the Grey Bombs, you still have to deal with the fact that there are two Remedy Bombs. As soon as the Grey Bombs die, though, the Remedy Bombs disappear. So the Grey Bomb's going to die, and the Remedy Bombs will go away. Any day now. There you go. And they're gone. And now you just kill the boss. We got LB2. We get to go. And uh, easy fight, easy life. Alright, and that's Pharaoh Series Hard Mode. That went a lot better than the last dungeon. <laughs> that went a lot better than the last dungeon. And we got the 50 bonus lore, so we're looking good. We almost have exactly what we need. Definitely giving it to the tank there. Didn't really get much in the way of accessories. And what is our currency sitting at now? Because I got those extra. Ooh, is that enough? Is it 395 or is it 385? I don't remember. Hmm... And yes, I am absolutely waiting on the Black Mage to exit viewing cutscene so he has a chance to give a commendation away, even if it's not to me. I was kind of hoping the other two would have left. And, uh, okay, now I'm going to exit. I got one commendation. I'm going to assume it was the Black Mage. <laughs> no, probably not. He probably gave it to the other DPS or something. And there you go. That's Pharaoh Series Hard Mode. I think I have enough tombstones to go get an earring. And then with the earring... That's going to that's gonna help quite a bit. I am going to really quickly hand in this Things Are Getting Serious quest. Because I don't want to have to... I don't, I don't want it in my quest log, pretty much. Yeah, I think I just go hand this in to Diamanda, don't I? Things Are Getting Serious. No, it's at... Uh, it's... Uh, Tre... 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 I mean, it could be Trakrate. Trakray. I don't know. I gotta hand it into this guy. How about that? That's I gotta hand it into that guy. He's the one I'm looking for. There we go. Quest complete. Uh, let me go see if there's enough. I don't remember. We've bought one of the accessories before. I just, I always forget. I always forget. It'd be really nice if I could get the earring from this video because patch 3.2 dungeons. What's the minimum item level for 3.2? I feel like it's 180. It went from 145 to 170 as the minimum. Does it, mean, does it, does it go up to 195 next? I'm 197, so I would have been okay, but the, the more I got, the better. Let's just put it that way. Disciple of Magic. 375. That's what I'm talking about. Give me that earring, boy. Yeah, yeah. Right, and I gotta go repair. There you go. Now we're at item level 204. Is it 205 for weeping? Oh, no. <laughs> I need a new weapon also. Like, bad. Getting a new weapon at this point, actually, th that's the main reason I want to get through to Dunscathe is so I can get a weapon, because I can get it with the, I, I'm aiming to get it with the, the scripture tombstones, where is my currency? I only have 91, I need a thousand, <laughs> so we're a while away from being able to do that, I could also pick up a different weapon as well, there's a few different weapons I could pick up, why did I come in here? Why did I, 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 all I want to do is check my Diddy Finder, it was, uh, it's 205, I feel. Yep, 205. I'm one item level short from being able to do 
the Weeping City. So the good news is I think the patch 3.2 dungeons drop item level 210 gear, which means if anything drops there, it'll bump my item level up. So I'm kind of counting on that. And I may actually want to save up lore tombstones for a 230 weapon first because I don't want to do all of this with an I-200 weapon. And I also kind of don't want to do Palace of the Dead to get the 3030. It's not a bad idea. It's just I'm not really interested in doing that. It'd be a thousand lore to pick up a weapon this way, though. Plus, I need the item. I need another item in order to do that. So there's there's a bit of trouble with that. So we'll see what I end up doing. I haven't entirely decided yet, but at least we almost have the minimum item level for the Weeping City. And once we get the Weeping City unlocked, I can actually do that repeatedly in order to pick up gear and then I can get to the pretty much the minimum item level for all the other content that's in the patch. The only thing I would really need to look out for is the actual uh, weapon item level because th that's, that's looking kind of problematic. You know, actually, I kind of wonder something. Before I end this video, I'm going to go check something real quick. I got 1.4 million gil. Mm, I don't think I can get a weapon for 1.4 million. I don't think, even if I tried to hit up a connection of mine, something that a new player probably doesn't have, I don't think I can get a weapon for that cost. Conjurer's Arms. Search. Two fit, how much is, oh! You know what, I might actually just purchase this. F, whatever. <laughs> there, I saved up 1.4 mil, and then I could just do that. Now I'm going to feel strong, by the way. Like, I'm going to feel really, really strong with a 50 item level bump. That is not an insignificant item level bump. I'll spend 890k on that. That's what all the gill I made with leveling up was for, so I can actually do something with it. You know what I'm talking about? So anyway, now I'm all set, by the way. Now I can do Weeping City. So uh, we might just do Weeping City in the next instead of going to the patch 3.2 dungeons because my item level bump from that is going to be far more significant than doing the 3.2 dungeons. So anyway, thank you for watching this video. Thank you to the Patreon supporters for bringing it back. We're trying to do this blitz here. Excuse me, this blitz here of as many of these videos as possible before Stormblood comes out. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. And stay tuned for the next one. Until then, take care.